I have given time to a couple of companies this week trying to sell me something. I normally don't do that, but uh, their original call, which was a cold call, you know, I do cold calling too. So I usually at least listen a little bit to find out what they are going to pitch me. And, and it sounded at least intriguing enough to give them, you know, what, 15 minutes or so to show me to do a screen share and all that stuff that a lot of people do. I was at least curious enough to learn what they were pitching. You know, in both cases, though, I got to admit, it didn't take long to realize that what they were pitching really wasn't a good fit for what I do. Either it uh, cost too much or it had so many bells and whistles that I would never get around to using it. So to me, it was overpriced. Um, but, but in both cases, interestingly enough, and this has happened with most of these types of pitches, it was all about them, what they did. Little to nothing about me or my situation. They didn't seem to care or ask questions. I mean, they didn't ask about my company. Uh, from their standpoint, it was, hey, look at what this does. I want to show you this. I want to show you this. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. All the great things that we offer. Me, 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 me. <laughs> I think salesmen get into that trap. Uh, I've gone through a great sales course, and I still learn from what I did uh, for that year in that sales course. Would love to go back. Maybe I will at some point. Uh, but so that has really changed my approach. And I think doing sales is you have to have sympathy and empathy and understand what your prospect is actually going through before you can sell them anything. So, hey, it's Tim Patterson. This is Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee for February 3rd, 2020, 61 years ago to the day since the day the music died. February 3rd, 1959 is known as the day the music died. Memorialized, of course, in American Pie and other songs. Uh, Don McLean did American Pie. Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper. J.P. Richardson was a disc jockey who got a couple of hits out of Texas, uh, flew out of Clear Lake, Iowa into history. It's a fascinating story. Uh, Buddy was 22. Richie Valens was 17, man. And the Big Bopper was 28. All right, back to the show. Be sure to check out the various websites in the Trade Show Guy world, including start with tradeshowguy.net. Uh, tradeshowguyblog.com is where I've been blogging for 11 plus years. Tradeshowguyexhibits.com is our main company site. Tradeshowexhibitbuyerskit.com is for... People that have never bought an exhibit are trying to get their hand on things and figure out what to do next. A lot of information there. Uh, also, information webinars at tradeshowguywebinars.com. I don't really do webinars anymore, but there's a pretty good archive there of a couple of years. And my two books, tradeshowsuccessbook.com and tradeshowsuperheroes.com. Lots of good stuff there. All right. Hey, got a fun interview this week. It's kind of a look behind the scenes at trade shows. Got to connect with Jim Worm who's the executive director of Exhibitor Appointed Contractor Association. Okay, that's a mouthful, right? Uh, we talked about all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And if you've never had a chance to walk the floor as, you know, a thousand or two thousand or three thousand booths are being set up over the course of three or four days, it's insane. It's crazy. There's so many moving parts. There's a lot of risk there. We talked about risk and, and covering risk and things like that. I think you'll learn a few things about what goes on behind the scenes with this particular conversation. I want to welcome Jim Worm, Executive Director at the Exhibitor Approved Contractor Association to Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee. Jim, it's a pleasure to have you on this morning. I appreciate it. Thanks very much, Tim. Glad to be with you. And you're on from uh, Bend, Oregon. Is that correct? Yes, I am. Uh, Bend is, of course, uh, dear to me because I grew up over in that area. Went to school for several years at Bend High. Graduated from there. So, I, I kind of consider Bend my, you know, my my home away from home, as it were. Yeah. Although it's changed a lot since I I got out of there. But you yes, uh, you I, like it over in Bend? You've been there a long time. I, I love it here. Uh, yeah, I've been here 25 years. Uh, oh wow, you've seen the changes. It, uh, a while ago, uh, I was sort of inspired by another friend of mine that worked in the uh, trade show industry who was a, basically a, a for-hire general service contractor account executive. And he basically uh, had several accounts and he would use different suppliers as, as subcontractors to, to handle the shows that he had under contract. And he lived in Breckenridge. And I was like, how do you do this industry and live in Breckenridge? He goes, I got to fly to the event wherever I'm going. I might as well live someplace I want to be. And I went, exactly. genius. He's a genius. I'm going to try to do the same thing. And that's how I ended up in Bend. I ended up in Bend. All right. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of exhibitors that really don't know about the uh, association. And so let's figure out, first of all, what is the Exhibitor Approved Contractor Association? Maybe a wee bit of history and where it came from and, and what they do. Sure. And actually, it's the exhibitor appointed. Appointed. Okay. Gotcha. 
Yeah, and that name uh, was an evolution. When I first started in the industry years ago, in the uh, early 80s, companies that provided services like that were, were called independent contractors, but that evidently created some heartburn for those who were in the show organizer side of the business and or the venue side. They didn't want people that were independent. They wanted to designate them as these are companies that were hired by their exhibitors to provide a variety of, of various different services on the show floor. So we formed the association in 1998 and we represent and support the interest of those, as we call them, EACs right. and all the other organizations that provide exhibit services on the show floor as selected by the uh, exhibitor as compared to the contractor that's selected by the show, which is known as the general service contractor. So but our mission as an organization is to, find ways to create tangible value for our members. And we do that in several ways. Uh, one of the first ways is to advocate to the industry at large for measures to improve the security and the safety of show floor operations. Uh, got a lot of moving parts on the show floor. We wanna make sure that folks that come there to do their job go home safely every night. Um, one of the other things that we do is we like to raise the profile of our, our member companies to prospective clients and that, uh, being a member of the EACA does confer a sort of a good housekeeping seal of approval to the exhibitor uh, population because all of our members uh, 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 sign off on and acknowledge a, a, a sort of a code of conduct that we've developed as in a code of professionalism that we've developed so that we know that our members follow the show rules, follow the venue rules and have safety programs in place to make sure that they do the best job possible for their clients. So give me an example of what kind, I'm curious, what kind of uh, companies, obviously there's installation dismantle, there's electricians, what other kind of would fall under that umbrella, I guess? Sure. We actually have, uh, I was just looking this morning in advance of our conversation, we actually have a total of 38 different categories. Wow. Of, <laughs> exhibitor appointed contractors, but the 10 major categories would be uh, companies that provide AV services, companies that do carpeting or flooring, uh, companies that provide computer rental and rental services, uh, a variety of companies that, that produce and provide exhibits, uh, floral companies, furniture rental, installation and dismantle, labor companies, uh, models and personnel, talent, uh, security companies and transportation are the are the major categories of, of our membership. That's uh, a lot. <laughs> it is. And what we other other things that we do, Tim, is we like to use the collective buying power of all of our members to obtain advantaged pricing for them on significant cost centers like supplies and equipment, payroll services that they may need, or health insurance, uh, workers' comp insurance, liability insurance we find ways to negotiate better rates for them than they could get by themselves. So are the companies members, are the individual employees members of the EACA? How's that work? I'm just curious. Yeah, all of our memberships are corporate memberships okay. so that uh, when the company is a, is a member that confers member privileges to every one of their employees, albeit we do uh, acknowledge that uh, there's a, quite a range of company sizes right uh, from the mom and pop type companies to our largest member is freeman you know because although most recognize a company like freeman as a general service contractor when they're providing services at a show where they're not the general say they're at a show that uh, ges is the general they're actually an eac in that regard so uh literally everybody in, in the industry that works on the show floor is an eac at some time um, so when an exhibitor goes to a, a show, you said you just got to Fancy Foods, albeit uh, Natural Products Expo West here in a few weeks. Right. Do they know they're interfacing with EACA uh, 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 contractors or does that just something that's kind of behind the scene that, that, that often exhibitors don't even know that they're getting involved with those types of people? Well, most of our members will obviously would publicize the fact that they're a member of the association. Like I said, that tends to confer them some uh, a little bit of a higher level of status in the industry. Um, exhibitors know that if they're hiring an EACA uh, association member, that they're they're getting a, the cream of the crop. And uh, as it relates to, do they know whether or not uh, they're members? One of the things that we did, and one of the inspirations for starting the association was uh, twenty some years ago. There are numbers of organizers that thought that um, the EACs were 
uh, something of a of a pariah that uh, they were causing problems on the show floor, which is counter to what actually goes on. But I think maybe inspired by the competition that the general service contractor was feeling, they they tried to throw up roadblocks to EAC's uh, hmm. opportunity to to service exhibitors at their show. And one of the ways that that happened was to charge a fee, an additional fee to an exhibitor if they hire an EAC, you know, and the, the rationale was, well, it, we have to go and make sure that they're uh, uh, appropriately licensed to do business there, that they have the appropriate union contracts if that's required, that certainly that they have the necessary insurance coverages to, to make sure that the organizer can manage their risk and not be responsible for any property damage or physical injury that might uh, happen as a result of, of their being on the show floor. And some of these fees were in the nature of $500 for, for yeah. every exhibit that the EAC was, um, was managing at the show. And uh, obviously that would create a lot of concern for our members because uh, if they were providing a, say a labor service for a, a pop-up booth, well, the invoice probably wouldn't even get to $500 for a, a, a quick pop-up and a right. teardown. And that would uh, obviously invalidate the, the opportunity for them to actually work that show for that company. So uh, we uh, advocated for them and actually created an online system for the organizer to say, you know, if, if that's creating you heartburn, we'll do it for you because we know these companies and we've done all of the background checks on them already. We'll develop an online system where your exhibitors can come to a password protected section of the EACA website, designate who your suppliers are, and we'll collect all the paperwork for you and uh, give you a list of all those that should be granted access to the show. So you're working with uh, obviously the exhibitor approved contractors that, as your members, and you're working with probably all, almost all the major show organizers through, across the country. Is it an international organization or just national? Well, we actually do have some international members, but most of our focus is with U.S. based uh, events. And so the international members that we do have would be companies that are coming here with their clients to, to provide services and they want to be, you know, in, in line with what is expected of an, of an exhibitor appointed contractor at the show floor. Um, that's one of the other things that we do is every show has its unique uh, issues, requirements, mm -hmm. challenges, and uh, we keep abreast of those and, and inform the members as to what the particular uh, issues that they want to make sure to, to pay attention to and to be mindful of as they're providing their services. And so we do have members from Europe, uh, from Mexico, from Canada, and the Far East. Uh, not, not huge numbers, but we do have some in, in sure. those areas. You know, you talked about, uh, you know, unions and, and regulations and things. Given the amount of regulations that cover so many different things on a trade show floor, and as you mentioned, the amount of risk and the number of people there, the number of exhibitors. I mean, I've, I've been backstage at, uh, as, you, as you call it, as they're setting up at, at the Expo West a number of times. And it's a fascinating thing, especially if you've never been there, to see all these th things coming through and and everything getting set up, it takes two or three or four days to get everything set up. Is it even possible for an exhibitor to have something done on a trade show floor by someone that's not an exhibitor approved contractor, given the size of some of these shows? Well, every show will have a, uh, a set of requirements for the um, contractors that an exhibitor will hire, whether they're an EACA member or not. Um, they will still have to follow um, those particular requirements to gain access to the show. Typically, the first step is that the organizer will, will want to know, uh, they will want to know based on the, a form that's in the kit, they'll ask the exhibitor to fill out what's called an exhibitor appointed contractor notification form. Notify us of who you're bringing in to service you at the show. And then uh, there will be, a, the follow-up process will be uh, primarily that the organizer will want to receive in advance a copy of that contractor's um, certificate of insurance, which shows the coverages that they have for general liability, workers' compensation, auto liability, things of that nature. Uh, and that is something that every organizer will do to make sure to manage the risk of them being the lessee at the building, right? When, when they hire, or excuse me, when they sign the lease at the convention center, 
they're on the hook for everything that happens in the building during the no term doubt. of the tenancy. And what the organizer looks to do is to uh, manage that as best they can to make all the individual parties that come in to do work on the show carry their own weight and have their own responsibility because the organizer doesn't want to be responsible for all of that. Exactly. Makes sense. I mean, there's just protection. And so it seems to me, uh, what I'm hearing is that if an exhibitor uh, is going to a show and they need someone to set up, they need someone to put carpet down, either they go to show services or if they hire someone that maybe give them a, you know, like a 10% break in price or someone they've worked with, obviously they want the protection. And so it really is, is a kind of a form of protection for everybody involved, right. not only the exhibitor, but as well as the organiza- uh, the organizer of the show, uh, the, the building owners, whoever that may right. be, whether it's a city or, or something like that, right. um, as well as uh, the exhibitor appointed contractor. I mean, it's, sure. just, it's just interesting that all these layers kind of, kind of work together. Uh, how, how has the industry changed that you've seen since you've been in the, the industry w- watching this and seeing how it moves along? Well, uh, and I've been in, there, in the industry for a long time. It's <laughs> going on uh, well, it's 35 plus years now. Yeah, exactly. There were far fewer uh, exhibitor appointed contractors when I first started in the business than there are now. At that time, most events uh, were primarily served by the general service contractor. Uh, The exhibits uh, were uh, more basic, simpler, because I think at that time the exhibitors, if they wanted to uh, bring in a booth, they they didn't know for sure that they were going to get the kind of servicing that could handle something of any kind of a complex nature or any kind of special skills. Uh, That's one of the advantages that exhibitors have when they use an EAC. It gives them more flexibility in how they want to display. And the reason for that is that the, the, the EACs, particularly those that provide the labor services, they'll do a lot of advanced work and prep for, for the show. They'll, they'll have all of the, um, all the renderings and the booth drawings and all of the different requirements that that display has. And as a result, what they'll do is assign those individuals that they know that have the right sets of skills to handle that type of work. And and many times it'll be the same individual that might be doing the fancy food show in San Francisco for their client, but they'll also go to New York in June because they know the booth. They can put it up more efficiently than somebody that's seeing it for the first time. And that's, that's why an exhibitor would hire an EAC is because that level of familiarity creates comfort versus just going to the service desk, getting the next two guys on the list who may never have seen this before right. and, and will be doing sort of a, a you know, on the job training as to how does this thing go together? Right. And, and the fact that uh, if someone's familiar with it, it's going to save time. And, and of course on the show floor, we all know time is, is money. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just curious, one more question. Um, um, what else uh, should exhibitors know about EACs when they start to exhibit? Is there something that they, you know, is there a place they can learn about this? Is there information that kind of helped them, uh, or is that something that the show organizer should share with the exhibitor? I'm just curious what your take on that would be. Yeah, most organizers are, are not that familiar with the EAC community. And I, I've been in that side of the business as well in, mm-hmm. in my, my career. I've been on the organizer side, worked for a large show management company for, uh, for several years. And most of my colleagues uh, had no idea who the EACs were because their primary focus was uh, building out the event, putting together the conference program and all the special functions and then turning over the operational logistics customer servicing to their general service contractor and just expect that it's going to be handled. Um, And as it relates to the EAC community, what the organizer many times may not realize is that, is that the EAC community is probably servicing the lion's share of the show floor. They're providing more of the customer service to their show than even their designated contractor is. And uh, you know, the, where somebody would learn more about who the EAC community uh, members are is, is part of our function. You know, so if an organizer or an exhibitor was going to a, a, a city that they hadn't been before, they wanted a specialty contractor, uh, we actually, one of the other values of being a member is we provide a, a database on the site where you can select the service category that you need and the city that you're going to, and it'll present the entire list of our members that do that kind of work in that city. Um, 
if there were other questions about it, we, we have a lot of information and documentation on the site to talk about the why. Why would you want to hire an EAC? And, and better yet, how? What kind of questions should you ask uh, before you make your final selection? So that information is available to, to anybody that would want to come to the, our site, which is at EACA.com. Uh, but failing that if, that, if they didn't find the information they were looking for, we're always open to getting direct contact. Gotcha. When I get calls fairly frequently from people and say, hey, I'm, I'm trying to solve this problem. Can you point me in the right direction? And because I know most of these folks personally, I don't ever just recommend one company to solve their problem, but I'll probably give them the top three or four that, that should be in their consideration set and let them make the decision. Gotcha. Uh, speaking with Jim Worm, who's the executive director of the Exhibitor Appointed Contractor Association. Uh, and appreciate your time, Jim. It's been a pleasure kind of learning about what you guys do. It's one of those kind of behind the scenes thing that a lot of exhibitors just don't think about. And it's kind of been fun to learn exactly what goes on with you guys. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tim. Enjoyed it very much. All right. Thanks again to Jim Worm of EACA for being on this week's podcast. I uh, really appreciate it. This week's trade show tip. You know, we have a lot of clients uh, doing things at the last minute for shows. We got a a lot of clients at a big show, Northwest, uh, Northwest Natural Products Expo West, which is happening in early March. And, you know, been working with the clients since really November, December to get things in line, depending on how big the project is. And I got to thinking about it. The longer you wait to get something done for the show, any show, whether it's uh, update your graphics, get a new back wall, brand new exhibit, maybe the closer the show to the show you get, the narrower and smaller your choices become. You get that? The closer you get, the narrower your choices become. So if you want a brand new island exhibit designed and built for scratch for a show, I mean, you got to start months ahead, like six months ahead. You got to start speaking to an exhibit house and designer a long ways ahead of time to get their take on how long it takes to do all this stuff. And, and frankly, from my perspective, most of the time, let's say you do have six months, most of the time should be put into design and making sure the design is right. Because once the design is set, Production is pretty straightforward, even for custom things. And they'll know well enough, the exhibit house will know well enough how long that will take. But if you want a simple back wall, a simple print, a banner stand, table throw, I mean, that's a couple of weeks. And frankly, some of this stuff turns down in three or four days, it turns around in three or four days. It was really simple and quick to print and ship. So again, the, the closer you get to the show, the smaller your choices become. So keep that in mind. This week's one good thing. I got to give a shout out to the Los Angeles Lakers. I've always not liked the Lakers, uh, who, but they put on a great tribute to Kobe Bryant and the others that were killed in the helicopter crash just over a week ago. Uh, the Lakers had postponed their Tuesday night game against the Clippers, which meant the next one was against the Blazers, my Blazers, on uh, Friday night. And they did a great tribute, had a nice video. I'm sure if you look around online, you can find it. If I, if I get a chance, I'll go look at it and em embed that in here. Uh, in the blog on the notes and oh by the way uh, once again that game the, the Blazers won by the way Damian Lillard showed why he's the best point guard in the league right now I mean last last five games 48 points 36 points 50 points 47 points 61 points uh, and he had seven three-point shots last night uh, or I should say the, the the Friday night I'm recording this on Saturday but on Friday night uh, Damian Little hit C, uh, seven triples and set a new NBA record with 40 made threes in a five-game span. That's insane. He's playing at such a high level. If you get a chance to catch him on TV and watch a game, you should do it. Have a great week and a good February. See you next week on Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee. 